The world is changing fast. Global pandemic, climate crisis, digital transformation, social inequality. The future can seem more uncertain than ever before. The sound of gunfire echoing. It's time to think about what kind of future we want. Time to think beyond today's new cycle. Time for a more hopeful future. We cannot predict what is going to happen tomorrow, but we can prepare better for shocks and surprises. Come and join us to explore the big challenges facing Europe and the world. We can choose the kind of future we want and the future we don't want. Hear how Europe can tackle these challenges and what strategic choices we need to make for the long term. It's time, time to, to think, think more clearly, clearly about, about the future. future. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues in the ESPAS process, I really have the great pleasure to welcome you all to this ninth ESPAS annual conference. Now, there are three first times for the ESPAS conference this year. It's the first time we're doing it in a hybrid format. It's the first to be web-streamed. Uh, and it's also the first since I had the pleasure of becoming the chair of ESPAS early this year. In recent months, we've been very busy reinvigorating the ESPAS process. Just this week, we published a midterm ISPAS Global Trends Report, The Global Future, an update. We've also started our work on a new interinstitutional horizon scanning project. We've revived our young talent network, where young professionals across the institutions are trained on how to apply foresight in policy making, and we've begun our planning for a series of foresight publications through 2022. This annual ISPAS conference is now well known as a key event in the international foresight calendar. It demonstrates the growing importance of foresight for policymaking right across the European Union. ISPAS has really shown the way in developing foresight literacy and collaboration right across the European institutions. And today we see all nine participating bodies in the ISPAS process growing their own foresight capacities. And I believe that this is really going to stand us in good stead in the coming years uh, as we move to look at new challenges facing us. Now, over these two days, we're bringing together about 60 eminent speakers who will offer and share their insights on shaping Europe's future, looking at global trends and strategic choices, which is the theme of this year's conference. I'm sure that you will enjoy what we could perhaps call a festival of ideas over the next two days, and I hope that you can all be with us for as much of the conference as you can. Day one, as has been the case for a number of years, is organized by the European Commission, and day two, by the European Parliament. And all of our partners in the ISPAS process have been closely involved in the planning of the conference, and indeed speakers from many ISPAS institutions and bodies will be participating with us over the next two days. I want to warmly thank all of the colleagues in the Commission and the Parliament for the excellent cooperation we've enjoyed in the organization of the conference. And as you can see from the program, we're going to discuss what resilience means in practice for an open Europe. We're going to explore the role that digital technologies can play in supporting the green transition. We're going to provide ideas on what the twin green and digital transition could look like, thanks to the ISPAS Young Talent Network. And finally, we're going to share some experience from professionals on how best we can use scenarios for policy making. So there's really a lot to look forward to. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first session of this year's conference, key messages from the European Commission's second annual strategic foresight report, which was entitled The European Union's Capacity and Freedom to Act. Now, before I introduce the distinguished speakers for the first panel, I'm delighted to say that the Prime Minister of Lithuania, Ingrida Shimonaite, who recently launched a foresight initiative called Lithuania 2050, has kindly recorded an opening video address for us. So let's now look at this video from the Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, 
dear colleagues, it is a pleasure and honor to address the 2021 Annual Conference of the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System on Shaping Europe's Future. It is especially important to discuss how to build the European Union's resilience and autonomy in a fast-changing world. It is also a good and timely opportunity to discuss foresight at the highest level. I welcome the European Commission's 2021 Strategic Foresight Report on the European Union's capacity and freedom to act. My key takeaway from it is the following. We can strengthen our union only if we preserve our determination to act, both individually as its member state and collectively as the European Union. I would like to take this opportunity to share my thoughts about what should be done and how. As a union today and in the future, we want to safeguard our liberal democracies in the rule-based international order and to enjoy the benefits of economic growth in a sustainable environment, not just for ourselves, but also for future generations. By and large, it is also what our citizens expect from us, the governments of EU member states, and EU institutions. I believe that we should strive to live up to this expectation by, first of all, acting at all levels, national, European and global, each time choosing the most appropriate level to leverage our strengths and compensate for our weaknesses. Secondly, I think that autonomy, as discussed by the European Commission, should be understood as capacity for and not from as serving substantive aims Europeans expect from us and not a goal in itself. We, as the European Union, should have the will and the ability to act as a leader in partnerships whenever possible and on our own when necessary. By embedding ourselves in global alliances of like-minded partners, we will achieve our ambitions in global governance, climate change, standard setting and regulatory policies technological development and reduction of dependence on strategic raw materials. There is hardly any other way for the European Union to continue to stay globally relevant in view of our shrinking share of global economy and population. Likewise, I cannot imagine European defense without NATO, which is the defense alliance for Europe. The European Union should act more assertively using our collective weight more heavily than we currently do to maintain a level playing field and protect our economies from unfair trade practices. We should fence off our strategic assets from those who do not share our values or seek to undermine our way of life. As a union, we can take more responsibility in our immediate neighborhood to the south and east, helping our neighbors to boost their prosperity and resilience, aiming to prevent them drifting away from us and to integrate those who want to be a part of our community. In these turbulent and geopolitically uncertain times, paradoxically as it may sound, my country, Lithuania, has had its dream of early 1990s come true, enjoying security and prosperity unseen before. This serves as well as a basis to take on our fair share of responsibilities in domestic reform, in our immediate neighborhood and on the global level. Domestically, my government has made a decisive shift towards the green transition, digital transformation, equitable education and improved governance. In other words, getting Lithuania ready for tomorrow, for our next generation. We know the price of freedom firsthand, not from history books. That is why we act in solidarity with those less fortunate and with like-minded friends and allies in our neighborhood and in faraway countries. It is our responsibility to assume and uphold. As good as it is, Lithuania is a hard-worn position from which we are embracing the future. We don't take it for granted and we know that the future may unfold in various ways. As a country, we know what we want to be. Open, liberal, democratic, reliable and prosperous. These goals will not change. But in these times of uncertainty and unprecedented change, 
it pays off to get ready for any possible turn of events. In other words, to anticipate. Therefore, three weeks ago, we launched a project we call Lithuania 2050, aiming to come up with a renewed vision for Lithuania, its possible long-term development scenarios and roadmaps through foresight and inclusive discussion. I'm very glad that on this road, we can both learn from and share with other EU member states, for many of whom foresight is becoming part of governance. Thank you very much and let me wish you a fruitful conference. Well, many thanks to Prime Minister Simonite for those inspiring opening remarks. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Vice President Maros Shevkovich, uh, uh, who's going to talk to us with his reflections on the Commission's second annual strategic foresight report, Europe's capacity and freedom to act. Vice President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Your Excellencies. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed uh, very happy to be back uh, at the 2021 edition of the annual ESPAS uh, conference. This uh, event provides the Foresight community with a perfect opportunity to discuss uh, medium and long-term trend facing Europe and the world and how they will affect uh, our policy making. This year I am delighted uh, that the Lithuanian Prime Minister Ingrida Shimonite agreed to open uh, the conference and I thank her wholeheartedly for her kind words and support. In October, I was very happy and privileged uh, to be present uh, as she launched the work uh, on the Lithuanian 2050 strategy, putting uh, the country into the exclusive but growing club uh, of member states leading the way on strategic foresight. National long-term strategies like Lithuania 2050 are an integral part uh, of our joint uh, efforts to build foresight capacities across uh, the EU institutions and national capitals. Where I became the first ever European Commissioner to be given specific responsibility for strategic foresight in 2019, there was little evidence of its systematic use uh, as an innovative uh, anticipatory governance tool. The only exceptions were perhaps Finland's Committee for Future, the Endus Kunta, and the Haut Commissariat au Plan in France. Since then, however, we have seen a great deal of progress. Exactly a year ago, at this same event, I announced the launch of the EU-wide foresight network of 27 ministers for the future. And this network is now a reality. Since its first meeting in Coimbra last May, organized with the support of the Portuguese uh, presidency, it now meets annually to debate uh, political priorities and issues of uh, relevance for Europe's future. There are also meetings at technical level every six months where Foresight Sherpas from all member states explore the future together. They have already started to cooperate around specific themes on Foresight clusters. At national level, Spain has been the leading light on Foresight. I was delighted to be in Madrid with uh, Prime Minister Sanchez earlier this year as he presented España 2050, an ambitious long-term strategy to revamp countries' position in Europe. The Prime Minister later came to Brussels in June to showcase the strategy to the member states and to the EU institutions. And it is encouraging to see many member states following suit. In July, I went to Athens to discuss with Prime Minister Mitsotakis their plans in the foresight area, including our prospective cooperation on the ongoing Beyond GDP network. We look forward to welcoming him to Brussels to present the Greek strategy early next year. 
President Macron. Meanwhile, has just announced France 2030, and we are currently discussing with Paris how to strengthen our foresight cooperation during the upcoming French presidency when the next ministerial meeting will be taking place. And Luxembourg has just held its Luxembourg Strategic Conference on anticipating possible futures, where the Minister of Economy, Franz Fayot, announced the use of our new resilient dashboards in Luxembourg's Belong Competitivité 2021. Within the Commission, we have also continued uh, delivering on our strategic foresight agenda. We have worked to systematically embed strategic uh, foresight into all major EU initiatives and policy making in general. One of the major tasks that uh, President Ursula von der Leyen entrusted me with in 2019. First, we have just published updated rules on better regulation, which makes strategic foresight an integral part of uh, impact assessments, major evaluations, and fitness checks uh, for key initiatives. The new Foresight uh, Toolbox will help ensure that our proposed initiatives uh, are future-proof, anticipate changes, and shape the future according to the EU's political priorities with a focus on the green, digital, geopolitical, and socio- and economic areas. Second, we have revived our cooperation in the context of uh, ESPAS, even was just referring to it a minute ago. And we did it by launching the key pilot project to create a systematic horizon scanning capacity built on the expertise of our institutions. Our goal here is to create a strong and collective early warning system, allowing us to scan the horizon on a regular basis. And if we succeed, it will make our policy makers more aware and capable of designing the right policies to face the next crisis. In other words, we will be taken a bit less by surprise and will be more capable of avoiding constant short-term crisis management. And I hope to present to you some concrete results of this work at the 2022 ESPAS conference. Third, our 2021 Strategic Foresight Report focuses on Europe's open strategic autonomy. It looked at uh, heightening our awareness of megatrends and emerging issues and providing a solid strategic framework to take concrete policy action to achieve this goal by 2050. I'm proud that the report has sparked a conversation on forward-looking priorities and has informed the Commission's uh, priority setting, the State of the Union address by our President, the 2022 Commission work program as well. Our first ever report in 2020, as I'm sure you remember, focused on resilience as a new policy-making compass. We drew early lessons about what the pandemic had taught us about Europe's resilience uh, across four interlinked dimensions, green, digital, social, economic, and geopolitical. And since then, the resilience has indeed become a pillar for all Commission policies, a key example being the far-reaching and ambitious next generation EU, which is our 800 billion euro strong instrument to modernize Europe and foster recovery. This year's communication zoomed in on the geopolitical dimension of resilience. We ask ourselves what it means to take the EU's open strategic autonomy and global leadership to the next level in the context of four major megatrends climate change and other environmental challenges, digital hyperconnectivity and technological transformations, pressure on democracy and values, and lastly, shifts in the global order and demography. And this work is already inspiring Commission initiatives, and it is making clear case for increased coherence uh, between Europe's domestic and external policy agenda across, across 10 areas of action to boost our union's open strategic autonomy. We know we have to do more to make sure that uh, in Europe we'll have sustainable health and food system. We need to advance uh, 
uh, to decarbonize uh, uh, our energy and make it more affordable. We need more capacities in uh, data management, artificial intelligence and cutting edge uh, technologies. And of course, we have to work very hard on a uh, steady supply of uh, critical raw materials. As Prime Minister just a few minutes ago highlighted, we have to ensure that our first uh, mover global position in standard setting is secure. And of course, we need to do more to future-proof our economic and financial systems. I'm sure that uh, our colleagues will discuss a lot how important the skills and talents are for Europe because we need them to match our long-term uh, ambitions. And I think also from our first address, uh, uh, we heard how important it is to enhance our security defense and space uh, capacities and to nurture our global partnership. And I think that one of the lines uh, which we followed very carefully in the interventions of our speakers uh, in our today's uh, would be also our common brainstorming, how to strengthen the resilience of our public uh, institutions and our European values. So this is the essence of strategic foresight being actionable and able to shape the best policies both uh, for today and for tomorrow. If you allow me to give you a, a concrete example in this regard. The changes to the state aid framework we proposed yesterday go in direction suggested by our report. We need to tackle the crucial technology and investment gaps in Europe's semiconductor industry to avoid the strategic dependence on third countries to fulfill the demand for chips, which will be the backbone of the economy of the future. We see clear signs that the semiconductor industry is on the verge of the new super cycle. Demand will be fueled by a number of trends, including an exponential increase in the Internet of Things connection, with up to 200 billion connected devices expected by 2030. The continued electrification, automation of the cars, artificial intelligence, 5G, quantum computing, all this would require more computing power, more chips, and hyperconnectivity. These trends uh, will lead to both a rising demand for faster and lower power chips with small node sizes and uh, the design of dedicated uh, chips for future applications like uh, the artificial intelligence. Moreover, through the miniaturization of transistors, the capacity of the chips per dollar spent has increased by a factor of 67,000 since 1990. However, the limits of physics for current transistor and architectures will be reached, reached by 2030. Therefore, the most likely trend will be a shift away from miniaturization and towards the new technologies and materials to offset upcoming physical limitations. For instance, alternative semiconductor materials like carbon nanotubes, new techniques like 3D integrated circuits, and complete redesign of the chip's architecture could, when commercially viable, disrupt the current market structure. This could present a prime opportunity for semiconductor companies in the EU to position themselves uh, while uh, this new market is still maturing. That is why we need a chip strategy that is bold, leverages our European strength in research and human capital. And we have to say that we are very lucky to have uh, in Europe leading research centers for semiconductors and nanotechnology like IMEG in Belgium, Fraunhofer in Germany, but also leading uh, institutes across uh, most of our member states. And that uh, we are able to address uh, the entire value chains of the semiconductor industry. So this is at the core of Europe's open strategic autonomy with foresight making a significant contribution. With this in mind, the theme of our 2022 strategic foresight report will be the twinning of green and digital transitions. The focus will be on emerging technologies that can make this possible. For instance, many pilot technologies have high, decarboni high decarbonization potential, such as clean hydrogen, low carbon fuels, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, next generation sustainable batteries, bio-based technologies and materials, methane cracking, 
high temperature superconductivity and advanced fusion based on nuclear reactors. Ladies and gentlemen, let me close uh, by underlining that uh, the European Commission is the first major public administration in the world to bring strategic foresight to the highest political level. However, if we want to succeed, it must be truly collaborative uh, exercise. And with this in mind, uh, I'm very happy that uh, three ministers uh, for the future from Austria, Caroline is here with me, but also our colleagues from Spain and Greece uh, are uh, joining us as well to give us their national perspective on our strategic foresight work and explain how they are embedding strategic foresight into national governance structures and policy making. I'm also thrilled that we will hear a perspective from Her Excellency Ohud Al Rumi, Minister of State for Government Development and Future of the United Arab Emirates. I'm convinced that we should jointly strive to develop a global perspective on foresight by creating a platform to exchange with our international partners, for instance, on horizon scanning and future relevant topics. This is a thought, an idea, and I would like uh, to leave us with, because together uh, with a call to be bold and optimistic about the future, we can achieve a lot. The ministers uh, for the future, distinguished uh, ESPA speakers and guests, uh, I count on the cooperation and support uh, of all of you, including in the vital task of communicating the value of our work on foresight to citizens. For example, I was uh, delighted to, co to cooperate with Prime Minister Sanchez on Gira Futuro, a series of dialogues with citizens and experts across the Spain uh, under the umbrella of the Conference on Future of Europe. I had the pleasure of attending one such dialogue myself on the future of science and innovation in Bilbao last October. And we need more of this outreach of which the annual ESPAS conference is another great example. So it was a pleasure to open this year's ESPAS conference and showcase that a strategic foresight has secured a firm place in European policymaking, no longer at the arm's length from the political level, our foresight family is growing and long may it continue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for those uh, opening remarks. And as you've said, uh, we're now going to hear from some of the ministers for the future from the European Union and indeed beyond. And it's my pleasure now to welcome Caroline Erdstadler, Federal Minister for the European Union and the Constitution from Austria, to share her remarks. Uh, Minister, the floor is yours, please. Dear Vice President, dear Marisch, dear Chair of Esbos, dear Stephen, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the organizers to organize the conference, Shaping Europe's Future. It comes timely, at a time where we are facing a lot of challenges in Europe. For example, the migration topic is not solved, digitalization, climate change, but it comes also, unfortunately, we have, have to put it like that, at a time where we are in the middle of the pandemic of COVID-19. The EU needs clear goals to be achieved. And we have to say it very clearly and positively. We achieved a lot in the last decades here in the European Union and in the member states, thinking of prosperity, of the process of integration, of the common currency, of our freedoms, the freedom to travel, I would also like to mention, even if we see during the pandemic or the migratory flows that it is limited, but we would like to see it again. And if we want to ensure all these achievements, we have to change our systems. We have to transform our systems regarding production, and also regarding consumption. Fundamentally, I would say, 
We have a lot of goals in the meantime. We have the goal of climate neutrality. The Fit for 55 package is on the table. Prote protecting also our industrial base is really needed to ensure also prosperity on our continent. And now we need measures. We need a way to go. We need to be better prepared for further challenges. And how can we do that? I think, Marosh, you give the right answer with a strategic compass and a foresight, EU-wide. We need a network where we can exchange our experiences, cooperate better, and exchange also best practice models. And I can tell you there are a lot of good best practice models also at the national basis. And turning to Austria now, I can say we have on the national level the Austrian Institute of Technology. We have the Federal Environment Agency. We have strategic units, for example, in the Federal Chancellery, the think tank Think Austria, or a newly dedicated department to EU communication and foresight. And also on the regional level, there is, for example, a future academy in one of the nine Austrian regions. The conference on the future of Europe is one very important thing to contribute also to this process of transformation. In Austria, we do have every second day an event dedicated to the conference on the future of Europe. One third is aimed to be dedicated directly to young people. Yesterday, I had a young conference on the future of Europe with young people. And I'm doing future labs. I launched them in the federal ministry, in the federal chancellery, with experts to get in depth regarding the discussions on the important topics. Last but not least, I have started an initiative. It, it is named Europe Begins in the Community. And I do have already about 1,200 municipal councillors to transfer the idea of the European Union. I think, dear Vice President, the Strategic Foresight Network is something very important. The Strategic Foresight Report 2021 is really in line with the Austrian focuses and the Austrian priorities. And we want to see in the next foresight report even more regarding digital and climate change, because then it's also in the line with the national F uh, reform program and the EU Next Generation Fund. And we want to achieve our goals. And these goals are really very ambitious one in Austria. I don't want to bother you with many numbers, but a few of them I have to mention here. Austria would like to be climate neutral already in 2040. Austria would like to achieve in 2030 100% of energy from renewable energy sources. And we know that we do have the need to ambitious changes. One thing we want to focus also on the transport sector, because one third of the greenhouse gas comes from the road and from the transport sector. And therefore, we have to do the shift from the road to the rail. And one important and last thing I would like to mention also here is that we need really the true costs when we are talking about the transport. The road costs, they should really be in reflected. In the Euro vignette, we do not see it reflected in the right way. So I could, like, uh, I could uh, mention even more things when it comes to AI, for example, which can help us enormously to do the change also in the climate sector, to achieve more efficiency in that regard. But the most important thing is that we are sticking our forces together, that we exchange our experiences, and that we draw also the lessons out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And for that, I was one of the first supporters of the idea also of the ministers of the future, because I think there is the need to have at least one minister who feels responsible for the topics of the future, not losing out of sight the current issues 
which are lying at the table and the challenges which are enormous, enormously challenging us at the moment. Thank you so much. And you will also have my support, dear Vice President Maros. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for those, those remarks. Uh, it's, it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce George Garapetritis, who's the Minister of State uh, in Greece. He's joining us uh, online. Minister, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and uh, I pass over to you for your, your remarks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be at the 2021 ESPAS conference. Um, a great thanks to, uh, Vice, to Vice President Marosevkovic for the kind invitation. Um, I'll try to exemplify uh, on two things. First, how Greece is embedding strategic foresight into, into its national governance, uh, including recent foresight projects that we're currently um, doing. And secondly, the added value of foresight in policy making at what should be the role of the Commission in this respect. Uh, to start with uh, our own home, the Greek government pays particular importance to the work and contribution of uh, foresight, especially in the post-COVID era. Uh, our Prime Minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, met with um, Maros Sefcovic on July 16th, and they discussed potential challenges faced by the European Union in coming years and the preparations to address these uh, challenges, especially in the context of the European Foresight Department of the OECD and the Strategic Foresight Unit. Um, the truth is that um, we have introduced in Greece a very high level uh, foresight team, uh, which is located right next to the prime minister and is directly subject to him. Um, the uh, chairman of this uh, commission is next to me, uh, the general secretary for information and communication, Mr. Yanis Masteriou, who's actually the heart of the whole project in uh, Greece. And of course, myself as the minister who is responsible from the political viewpoint uh, concerning the uh, foresight in Greece. The last six months, our team uh, has proceeded to the signing of cooperation agreements with several bodies. We try to be uh, as uh, broad as possible concerning our social involvement, such as scientific council, NGOs, other governmental bodies. Uh, the target is to build concrete soil for cooperation and foresight agenda of uh, common interest. Uh, furthermore, uh, in the context of the operation of the European Foresight Net Network, uh, Greece uh, will contribute as project leaders to two clusters, uh, which we consider that is very important for uh, our own foresight team. It's um, the Futures Literacy, literacy uh, Cluster and the Future of Innovation Cluster. Uh, the former has the objective to increase capacity building on uh, futures literacy and investigate options in integrating futures literacy approaches for innovating and identifying creative roads to address national and European challenges. The latter cluster uh, has the uh, objective to take advantage of the horizon scanning process in foresight and to set up a knowledge sharing platform for member states and the European Commission uh, services, focusing on signals of change with uh, an impact on the innovation uh, landscape. Apart from this, our foresight team focuses on uh, various urgent issues from climate change, and social division due to coronavirus pandemic, to migration crisis and rapid demographic uh, development. Um, we have a very rich agenda that we try to adapt to contemporary circumstances. Uh, further, uh, Greece's commitment to uh, uh, the scope and uh, significance of the foresight for EU member states will continue to evolve uh, within 2022. Uh, I isolate two major uh, interventions, two major goals for the next year. The first is our National Foresight Report, Greece 2050, which is currently undergone and we expect uh, to have it out uh, in 2022. And the second is uh, a proposal that the Vice President has already discussed with uh, our Prime Minister, uh, and it is the expansion of the indicators with which, which, with which we measure our returns. Um, it is obvious, I think, to all of us that the um, 
ordinary GDP indicator is no longer the only basic indicator for calculating the situation of a country or a union of state. Um, in Greece, our foresight team, in working on some new and innovative methods of calculating the future situation of uh, a state, um, that is where we want to be and not only from where we're coming. And this index is what we call the SOFI uh, index, the state of the future index, which is a pooled index generated through the analysis of selected variables in order to reveal whether the conditions of reality are improving or worsening. Uh, SOFI can be used as an oversight indicator of the state of reality and uh, the general calls of the future combining individual indicators that monitor the appropriate set of variables into a single outcome. Uh, it is a very ambitious plan that we are currently undertaking and we consider uh, that this is of huge added value for Greece and for the European Union. A few weeks ago, uh, just to mention that uh, the Commission has adopted its second annual strategic foresight report. Uh, it is obvious that we, as Europeans, will face a number of important challenges in the coming uh, years. Uh, we believe that uh, if we're going to become truly united in this post-COVID world, it's crucial that we develop our own vision of the future and design a new vision that is future-ready. Future um, it is with great pleasure that I hear the Vice President referring to the strategic autonomy of the European Union, which is a major goal uh, for all of us. And I think this is a good time to tackle all those issues. Um, as many things that used to be considered normal uh, are now um, in, in, uh, in a state of a new normality in the post-COVID uh, era. And obviously, in the next decades, Europe and the world will face tremendous uh, challenges. The four challenges that have been identified by the 2021 Strategic uh, Foresight Report uh, is, of course, in the forefront, climate change and other environmental challenges, the digital, digital hyperconnectivity and the technological transformation, pressure on democracy and values, and the shift in the global order and um, demography. Um, we need to bear in mind, and this is, I think, of crucial importance, what is widely said, that we're not going back to normal. Resilience, agility, and creativity will beat everything else. Um, and in this respect, the bottom line is that we are not going back to normal, but that we're heading towards a series of uh, those new normalities, uh, which is considered to be uh, beset by volatility, uncertainty, co complexity, and uh, ambiguity. Um, I would like to add one point, which is, I, in my eyes, a very crucial issue, and this has to do with uh, democracy and foresight. It is usually referred in the European discussion, the democratic deficit of current politics, especially on the EU level, because of pathologies in structures and decision-making, generally uh, lack of uh, legitimacy. I think foresight enhances and strengthens democracy in two ways, uh, through public participation and through the adoption of future-oriented uh, policies. Firstly, in preparing us for the future, uh, through making alternative possible, plausible, and preferable scenarios for the future, there is a wide involvement of the uh, society, uh, and this is a, a truly democratic process, a bottom-up process with the involvement of citizens. And secondly, I think a distinctive element of foresight is that it enhances future-oriented policies which result in intergenerational sustainability uh, by identifying challenges of the future and uh, introducing them into current policy making rights of future generations are becoming a relevant consideration and through this democracy is strengthened and become more solid and uh, sustainable after all it is obvious that this intergenerational sustainability is a condition of um, democracy um, we must link uh, to end uh, my uh, speech, um, we must link actions for the future of Europe with foresight actions of member states. We need a new operating system for Europe. In some ways, it's already it's already booting up all around us. For example, in trying stimulus packages to green New Deal goals or to new digital packages. 
Uh, I think this is for all of us a win-win situation because it amounts to a wider engagement of people because it is, after all, uh, our common future in Europe. Thank you so much for uh, hearing me. Well, thank you so much, Minister, for your intervention. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Jose Manuel Albarez Bueno, who is the Minister for Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation in Spain. Uh, Minister, thank you for joining us online today, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Maros, I'm very happy to see you uh, in the screen. Uh, dear colleagues, I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, of being here today discussing such an important issue as foresight with uh, the other ministers of the future. Uh, this is the first chance I have actually to participate in, in a foresight event in my capacity uh, of Minister of, of the Future. And I am so convinced that foresight efforts are vital in the policy making process. Foresight isn't about predicting the future. It is about giving us, decision makers, some of the analytic tools we need to shape it. Foresight design scenarios, but projecting into the long and medium term the consequences of the decisions that we take today. It is our way of gaining control over how we design the future instead of being forced to constantly react to circumstances beyond our control. In essence, it's doing politics the right way, the way citizens want us to make it. This week, we had a concrete example of how this issue has become a priority in all aspects of decision making at European level. On Monday, I participated in a meeting of Ministers of Foreign Affairs and Defence, uh, a joint meeting in Brussels, where we had the chance to discuss the first draft of the strategic compass that we expect to adopt in the French presidency next semester. Among different issues, including in the compass, it poses several questions that I believe contain the essence of what we should do in foresight. What risk we face, what capability we need to face them, how we can acquire them, and who should we count on to do so. Spain has taken this effort, our effort, your effort, very seriously. We are implementing an ambitious program and we have developed a thorough network of units and organisms dedicated to policy planning and foresight, all of them integrating in the EU foresight network. On the institutional side, there is within my ministry a unit specifically dedicated to this issue. The Strategic and Foresight Office, which is now under my direct supervision, given the importance that I attach to it. One of its most important tasks is the coordination of the drafting of Spain's foreign action strategy, a document that gathers the overreaching guidelines and principles for Spanish foreign policy over a four-year period. And we work hand with hand with other specific units within our government, especially the National Strategic and Foresight Office, which reports directly to Prime Minister. But this is not just about the institution and the bodies we create. We have to put them to use. We have to identify ways in which certain policies can be improved. This is why we have launched periodical foresight reviews on issues such as the geopolitical consequences of energy transition policies or the challenges associated with technological change. There are no abstract, abstract discussion on issues unrelated to the common concerns of our citizens. They have a direct repercussion on the day-to-day -day of our society. Take, for instance, the, the recent spike in energy prices. It has been a perfect storm caused by the sudden increase in energy demand because of the economic recovery, together with European energetic dependence. 
it has hit us hard in the worst moment, threatening our recovery and fostering inflation. We are proposing, therefore, a European response to what we consider is a European problem with fundamental changes in the way we approach energy policies. The reaction has not yet been as ambitious and we would have liked it, but we will keep pushing this issue in the European agenda. This is the essence of foresight efforts. We anticipate, we adapt, and we offer solutions according to the magnitude of the problem. We have done so with our joint vaccination program, with the recovery plan, or with the proposal to create a rapid response force. We are taking this exercise very seriously here in Spain. We recently launched Spain 2050, the most ambitious strategic foresight exercise ever undertaken in Europe at the national level. Its objective is to broaden the time horizons of public debate and generate, through a broad and cross-cutting dialogue, a fair vision of the country we want. In addition to this, we have been working to reinforce the social legitimacy of this initiative by launching a nationwide reflection exercise called Dialogue About the Future. This is a series of events with representatives of the government at the national, regional, and local level, as well as representatives of civil society, business, and EU institutions. Maros, I'm happy you could participate in the launch together with Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez. I also know you have participated in several of their events. When this exercise concludes on November 25, some 400 speakers of all profiles and political parties will have participated. And more than 20,000 citizens will have attended in person or remote, an absolute success that demonstrates the commitment of a Spanish society to finding ways of building a better future. Our objective now is to draw up a long-term national strategy that will help to set objectives, establish consensus, coordinate efforts, and ensure that Spain consolidates its position as one of the most advanced countries in the EU over the next decade. In short, Maros, Spain has heard well your call for stepping up our foresight efforts, and I can assure you that we will have, that you will have my full support to continue developing this policy within the European Union. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel, uh, for your kind words and for the insight how Spain is really advancing <clears throat> uh, in uh, using the foresight is really this very modern anticipatory governance tech thing. And I also would like to thank uh, the Greek colleagues for their perspective and also for the vision of the Prime Minister, we, uh, which was presented to me when I uh, had the honor to see him uh, in Athens a couple of months ago. And I'm, I'm also thrilled that uh, I can uh, introduce Her Excellency. Uh, Ohud Al Rumi, Minister of State for Government Development and uh, Future of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, we had an excellent meeting just a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, where we saw that we have a lot of a lot of uh, uh, common themes uh, to discuss. And I will just uh, uh, use this opportunity to congratulate you on uh, excellent expo and uh, also. Uh, as we discussed at that time, uh, I told you that I, I thought that you would win also another uh, election than you did. So we will be very important organizers of, of crucial COP28. Uh, and now we are all uh, very much uh, looking forward to your address, uh, to your remarks, so we can also learn from other countries outside of the European Union how they are using foresight techniques in their governance. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours, madam. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. First of all, I would like to thank His Excellency Maro Shikovic for the invite to address this important gathering Focus on the Future. It gives me great pleasure to be here today among people with whom I share the job and passion of creating the future. 
Not long ago, this future job was very different. In fact, maybe it was easier because changes in global trends were fairly incremental. But today, the pace of change is accelerating without bound. And in 20 years, the rate of change will be four times its speed today. This makes working on the future more complex. And with governments being increasingly consumed with running day-to-day -day operations, it's not easy to stay focused on the future. And as we know, the future might cause new challenges, but it will also bring new opportunities, which governments need to take advantage of. This requires three things. Adopting a multifaceted, multi-generational, whole of society approach that leaves no one behind. Building stronger mission-oriented collaborations and strategic partnerships for a better future, and enhancing future readiness and resilience for whatever the future may hold, the pandemic being the latest living example. In the United Arab Emirates, future orientation is not something new. It is embedded in our DNA as a nation. Since the founding of our nation, we were always blessed with wise leadership who had the vision to dream about the future and the willpower to design it and execute it. And we are also blessed now with the continuity of our vision and directions for the future and the persistence to deliver on them. This year, the UAE turns 50 and we are working on our plan for the next 50 years. But as we celebrate our Golden Jubilee, we also celebrate the achievements of our Vision 2021, through which we succeeded in building a unique global model of growth, openness, tolerance, and diversity. Future orientation and foresight are also key drivers of the UAE government decision-making process and agenda. For example, when we launched our e-government program 21 years ago, there was no pressing need for it. But it was such a foresight that cemented the resilience of our government and helped safeguard lives and livelihood during the tough times of the pandemic. Moreover, the UAE government structure is inspired by foresight. As such, the future is strategically placed at the center of the UAE government with a dedicated ministerial portfolio. In addition, we currently have ministers for climate change, food and water security, advanced technology, youth, AI, digital economy, and remote work applications, because we know these areas will be of extreme importance in the future. And as we embark on a new journey for the next 50 years, it's very important that we keep our nation's future orientation as the source and inspiration of action. In this spirit, the UAE recently announced 10 national principles for the next 50 years. And if you allow me, I would like to briefly touch upon four of them. First, we know that human capital is the essence of the future. Hence, we are working on two parallel fronts, building our national talent and the skills for the future and at the same time, attracting and retaining the world's top talent, because we know that global competition for talent will be much more intense in the future. Second, there are new economic models and sectors emerging, such as the circle economy, the exabyte economy, and the well-being economy. And these sectors and models will add up to 30 trillion US dollars to the global economy by 2025. We want to build a dynamic, future-oriented economy with the aim of providing the best quality of life for people living in the UAE. Third, we also know that the future is digital. And the power of nations will not only be measured by size, resources, political or economic power. Therefore, we are working towards becoming a nation of digital and scientific power with ambitious digital and scientific agendas that aim to double digital contribution to the economy by 2031. Fourth, we believe that a better future for humanity is one with shared human values. 
Therefore, we continue working on preserving and spreading our universal Emirati values of openness, tolerance, respect, and human fraternity, and continue being a force for good and peace in our region and the world. Finally, I would like to leave today with three reflections. First, I believe the best time to create the future was yesterday. The second best time is today. And that in building future readiness, the earlier we start, the readier we will be. In short, we should create the future now. Second, due to the accelerated pace of change, governments need to balance being future oriented with addressing current pressing need. As such, we need clear visions and directions with continuity over the long term, but agile and flexible strategies over the short term. And third, as government, we need to build new mindset and capabilities to tackle future challenges and take advantage of the new opportunities. It is very, very important to apply this foresight in practical and quick ways in government work. Legacy models cannot keep with the pace of transformation the future is bringing. They should be disrupted and new models need to be created. This includes also creating tools to assess the impact of policies through a future readiness lens and finding new and better ways, including better indicators to assess future readiness across all sectors and domains. And of course, more forums such as this one today to discuss the future. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to join the future community in the eighth edition of the World Government Summit that will be held in Dubai on 29th and 30th of March 22, with the aim of inspiring and enabling the next generations of government. Thank you again for the invitation, and I look forward to our continued collaboration. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those, those inspiring words and for sharing your perspectives with us. It's been a real pleasure to have you with us on this, on this platform. Um, we've now heard a variety of perspectives from the ministers of the future. Uh, and as we start to conclude now this session, uh, I'll just you know, give you a couple of highlights of the things that I've taken from this discussion. We've heard a lot about the very vibrant array of activities already going on at national level. We've heard about the power of networking, the power of exchanging best practice, both between the institutions in the European Union, but also beyond at national level. Uh, we've heard about the importance of developing our own European vision, our own particular brand. Uh, we've heard about the importance of embedding foresight in policy making. Uh, I think it was the, the Spanish minister who said, doing politics the right way. Uh, or we've just heard uh, that the minister saying, creating the future now. Uh, it's all about how we can embed in policy making. We've heard about practical applications of foresight in a whole variety of examples given by the vice president amongst others. Um, we've heard about the link between foresight and democracy uh, and the need to give some clear directionality. So a very rich exchange. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn now uh, to you, Vice President and, and, and Minister, uh, on, on, on the podium here, to maybe get a couple of uh, reflections and reactions from your side of what, of what you've heard. One thing that, that struck me through the different interventions was the challenges you face as politicians in managing the tension between dealing with the day-to-day -day crises that we're facing, the day-to-day -day challenges, and the need to keep this relentless focus on the future and thinking ahead and preparing better. And so I just wonder if you also have any reactions on, on how you live that tension in your, in your, different, um, in your different portfolios. Um, maybe, uh, Caroline, I could pass to you first just to see, if, I mean, react on anything that you've heard in the, in the different sessions. Please, over to you. Thank you so much. Well, I think the most important message is that uh, we are all of the same opinion that we need to be better prepared to tackle current challenges and all the future challenges. And uh, to be pre better prepared, we need foresight. Uh, and you mentioned it also, politics is a business where you have to react quite quite quickly. Uh, you are dealing with one challenge from one day to the other sometimes and even in the in the pandemic it is so that you can't plan on a long run. So um, I'm really grateful uh, that Maros uh, had uh, this initiative, the idea, and that he's really bringing things forward in that regard and that we are also dealing with the downside uh, of future 
technologies, for example, digitalization. It's in everyone's mind. We had it during the pandemic. It was uh, the linking thing between us as nations uh, to the European level, but also to the municipal level and the regional level. Uh, but we have to deal also with the downside of these uh, technologies. And I heard it also uh, during uh, the intervention of uh, the colleagues uh, from Greece uh, and from Spain, um, that it is now the time to tackle these challenges and there are a lot from the hate in the internet for example um, to cyber security but also to AI and uh, if we want to use AI in the best way uh, then we have to base it on the human rights and on European values and I think it is the time now to think to the future in the long run and to prepare for the future and I can only end by saying we are ready we are standing close to you, dear uh, Vice President. Uh, and um, as uh, the colleague uh, said, uh, the last colleague now on, on the podium, um, it is the, the second best time to start it now. But I have to say, you started it already one year ago. And therefore, I think you are really the right man in the right position, and, and we will support you the best we can. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Vice President, uh, maybe some cl concluding remarks on your side, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Caroline. I think that your, your summary uh, was indeed uh, uh, excellent. I think there was one, one common theme in the all, all intervention, and what was quite impressive was this uh, need for the, for the long-term planning, because uh, the changes uh, do not happen over the time. If you want to change uh, your, your energy system, it takes uh, decades. If you want to digitalize your economy, uh, it takes uh, years. If you want uh, to introduce new curriculum to the universities, you have to prepare it. Uh, the young people have to learn it, and then they had to uh, uh, be in a permanent effort to, to keep it up upgraded because the, uh, because, uh, the life uh, uh, and new technologies is uh, so dynamic. So it's very uh, impressive to hear from you, Caroline, and thank you very much for your support that uh, you are leading the way in uh, how to become climate neutral. And, and to do that in 2040, somebody who was before that responsible for energy union, I know that it's a challenge, and I'm sure that uh, who else, if not Austria, would accomplish it in 2040 with your dedication, with your talents, and with your excellent uh, uh, technologies. And uh, uh, to be 100% based on uh, renewables, uh, already looking at my watch in the, in the nine years, it's uh, also very impressive. And I think that we would uh, uh, all have to learn how to uh, accommodate our, our, our systems, our economy to be re completely renewable because this is the goal, this is where we all want, all want to be carbon neutral society by 2050 and therefore we need pioneers, we need the new technologies, we need to, uh, we need to have the vision how to, how to get there. I also would like to thank our colleagues from, uh, from Greece because with uh, George uh, Gera Petris, uh, Petritis we, we had already these talks before in in uh, Athens, uh, and again, uh, the push and the drive uh, uh, of the, the Prime Minister, which was so well expressed uh, in uh, the Porto European Council conclusions that we have to look uh, how we can measure what uh, Minister Al Rumi mentioned, well-being society in a new innovative way, that we have to look what is there beyond GDP. How can we use, for example, our res resilient dashboards, these new data sets, just to simply reflect uh, the economy as we want uh, to have it uh, in the 21st uh, century, and therefore your SOFI plans, uh, your push for you know, scientific uh, assessment of all the aspects in this regard, I'm sure would be of the huge contribution to all of us in the European Union. Jose Manuel said that we had excellent meeting a couple of days ago, and, and he's right. And what I very much appreciated in Spanish reports was not only this long-term planning for 2050, but also that outreach uh, to the society to, uh, to organize the meetings where you can talk to 20,000 uh, citizens about the future, about what you want to do, and to do it in uh, all important cities across the Spain, and I had the chance to uh, participate in Bilbao in such a discussion, is, is, is very important because uh, the future is something what is interesting for the young people, what is interesting for middle generation, what is, what is also interesting, as I learned again in Spain, also for our, our grandmas and grandpas, because they want to know in what kind of uh, world uh, the children and the gra uh, grandchildren would be, would be living. 
thing. And, and, and therefore, there is, uh, I would say, this encompassing uh, interest and, uh, and the passion for having uh, this uh, long-term planning. Austria, 2030. 2040, Spain 2050, and then, as Madam Minister explained to us, the planning for the next uh, 50 years, how it should be uh, in 2071, what should be accomplished by then, and I think that we all agreed we have to focus on circular economy, uh, science, uh, digital technologies, renewable energy, and uh, uh, we also have to factor in that uh, our citizens want us to build the well-being society to focus on quality life much more than we ever did before. So to conclude, Stephen, I would like to uh, thank you not only for excellent uh, moderating of the first panel, but for all the uh, hard work of ESPAS and the Joint Research Center, which you are leading in a close cooperation with our colleagues uh, in the European Parliament, because I think with a very good, very inspiring start, we'll have uh, now very important, interesting speakers, and of course I will be very happy uh, to come to the podium again tomorrow when we can, I believe, uh, summarize the main takeaways uh, and uh, to motivate uh, our foresight communities to get inspired uh, uh, by them and to show them that we on the uh, political level are very much interested uh, in this idea that we want to use this new anticipatory governance technique as much as we can so we will be less surprised and better prepared for the future and I think that's our common task. So thank you very much to all the viewers, all the participants, speakers. I think we are off to the great start and looking forward to the next sessions. Thank you, Stephen. Great. Thank you so much, Vice President. Um, thanks for your inspiration and your leadership. Um, uh, that brings us to the end of this opening session. My thanks to the Vice President, my thanks to all the ministers for participating in this, in this discussion. Uh, I think we've kicked off to a great start. Um, coming up next, we will have a session on resilience in practice. What does this mean for an open Europe? That's going to be moderated by Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund. It starts at 11.30, so we have a couple of minutes uh, to breathe, and then we're back online with the next session very shortly. Meantime, thank you very much, and see you all very soon.